Good afternoon or good evening, depending on which time zone you're joining us from today. Welcome to The Open Mind, a lecture and film series that brings together thought leaders in science and culture for meaningful and relevant conversations about mental health issues. The Open Mind is sponsored by the Friends of the Semmel Institute for Neuroscience and Human Behavior at UCLA and the Resnick Neuropsychiatric Hospital Board of Advisors. I'm Vicki Goodman, and it is my honor and great privilege to welcome and introduce today's featured speaker, Ashley Judd. Many of us know Ashley as the beloved award-winning actor and author who hails from a world-renowned family of performing artists. But we may not be quite as familiar with her work as a fiercely dedicated feminist social justice humanitarian who serves as the goodwill ambassador for the United National Population Fund, the Agency for Sexual and Reproductive Rights and Justice, and who in 2019, was named the United Nations Global Advocate of the Year. In this work, Ashley has traveled to 22 countries to be in community with girls and women in brothels, slums, orphanages, hospices, and on the streets. She also equally devotes her time to studying the endangered great apes, bonobos, who live deep in the Congolese rainforest where their egalitarian, matriarchal society gives her hope. She received her master's degree in public administration at Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government and at Harvard Law School, her graduate school paper, Gender Violence, Law and Social Justice was awarded the Dean's Scholar Award. We are also honored to welcome world-renowned neuroscientist, Dr. Jonathan Flint, who will join Ashley in discussion. Dr. Flint is a British behavior geneticist, and you will hear his beautiful British accent in just a moment, who has fundamentally advanced the understanding of the genetic basis of behavior, thereby determining the direction of research in psychiatric genetics. He trained in medicine and psychiatry in London and in Oxford before moving to UCLA at the beginning of 2016 to become one of the leaders of UCLA's Grand Challenge for Depression, a campus-wide initiative to find the causes of depression and to use that knowledge to develop new effective therapies. Now, before we get started, just a few housekeeping notes. Today's program will run for approximately one hour with the last segment reserved for your questions. If you would like to ask either of our speakers a question, we ask that you please type it into the Q&A, which is located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. As you can imagine, we have a lot of viewers today, so we will do our very best to get to as many questions as possible in the time allotted. Today's program is being recorded and will be available for viewing on our YouTube channel, which you can find on our website, friendsofthesemmelinstitute.org, beginning tomorrow. There you will also find a library of videos from past Open Mind programs, a calendar of upcoming events, information about the Friends Research Scholar Program that awards grants to early career neuroscientists, and about the Open Mind Film Festival for high school students that will be held on April 27th, 2023. And I am very excited to announce for the very first time, and it's not even posted on our website yet, that our fundraising event, WOW 2023, will be held on May 4th at Royce Hall. And our special guest will be, wait for it, Oprah Winfrey. Watch our website for more information on this exciting event that will raise funds to support mental health education, research, and patient care at UCLA. And now, without further ado, let's give a warm Zoom welcome to the remarkable Ashley Judd. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. And what an interesting way to start a talk about mental health, well-being, 
in which stress definitely plays an enormous factor as everyone knows today, because I've had the most stressful debut to our incredible Semmel, Friends of Semmel talk tonight. Um, and it's gonna be interesting to talk about self-regulation and breath and cortisol and all of that stuff, which I have got absolutely boiling in my system right now. Uh, we live, we're blessed to live out in the country in rural middle Tennessee, and we had a power outage yesterday. And what I did not know, even though we had done a rehearsal for our incredible talk with Dr. Jonathan, Jonathan Flint was that my internet was not restored. So when I came on tonight, my sound and my, my image were not synced. And so I came running over to my pop's house my mom and my pop's house. And uh, we had quite a time getting signed on. So I got to practice all of my self-regulation tools in order to join you with some modicum of um, serenity. So I'm delighted to be with you tonight. And I'm very honored to have been invited by this esteemed Semmel Institute to have a discussion with a neuroscientist. And I have to say my mom will be pleased as punch because although she was known primarily as a country music legend who won five Grammys and charted many number one songs, she was a great lover of the brain and she had the utmost respect for medicine, for science, for evolution. Um, she had a knack for knowing Nobel Prize winners. And so maybe, hey, that's auspicious for the great Dr. Flint. And uh, I'm so glad that she's with us tonight here in spirit. So I was asked to talk a little bit about, at first, my book, All That Is Bitter and Sweet, and then we're gonna bring in my, my phenomenal conversation partner. And you know, All That Is Bitter and Sweet is a book that I began writing when I started traveling around the world. When I was so fortunate to be trusted by non-governmental organizations like Population Services International, and who do public health work, feminist gender equality, um, you know, data-based, evidence-informed public health work. And the first place I found myself on my very first trip was in the brothels outside of Phnom Penh in Cambodia. And of course that was um, shocking and traumatizing, but no, no, no more for me than it was for the vulnerable folks who live in those settings. And in order for me to process and for me to stay alive and more importantly, for me to be able to go back and to hold those stories and to transmit those stories with dignity and respect, I found I needed to write. And I needed to be able to tell the rest of the world about what I was seeing and how gender inequality inheres in so much of the world's troubles and how male sexual violence was perpetrating so much of the poverty that I was witnessing. And so 822 countries and, and 800 pages later, we winnowed this down into the book, All That Is Bitter and Sweet. And what I really bumped into was my own mental health as well. And I learned that trauma that I don't transform is trauma that I will transfer and that I needed to learn how to care for myself along the way. And that it takes some, some audacity to think I might have something to give without really caring for my own mental hygiene first. And I was fortunate in 2006 to be um, intervened upon by the great Tenny McCarty at Shades of Hope in West Texas, who said to me, no one ever thinks to do an intervention on the lost child, which was the role that I had played in my family system growing up. And so I had the gift of going to treatment for, for seven weeks. And there I started to address the unresolved hurts of my childhood, the unresolved grief, the unresolved trauma, and the childhood depression that had begun to visit me at the age of seven when I was molested by a man for the first time. So that is some of what we will be talking about tonight with the great behavior geneticist, uh, Dr. Jonathan Flint, who is looking for, I mean, he's been cited, I think I read 49,000 times um, and began his empathy and compassion for those who have carry a mental health burden when his mother founded the first suicide hotline in the UK and he began answering the phones with her when he was a teenager. So this is some of what we're going to explore together tonight. And it's now my pleasure and honor to welcome him into our conversation. Please join us. Thank you. Thank you so much for introducing me in that uh, very flattering way. It's kind of you to uh, regard me as um, such a great neuroscientist. I don't really feel that myself, but um, I think one of the problems of our field is that we struggle with the research because it is such a hard problem to address. And the uh, advances we make, um, you were kind enough to, to comment on them, we find um, them to be so little, particularly commensurate to the problem that we're facing. Uh, so thank you for that, Ashley. I, I wonder whether we could start, though, with um, just going a little bit 
about uh, your own experiences? Because I think certainly for me, it's been extraordinary uh, discovering about you, what you've been through, and um, really to start a discussion around this question of resilience and why is it that some people um, have extraordinarily difficult lives, but in some cases prosper, if I may say you have done, and for other people, relatively minor things derail them and they find life very hard to cope with indeed. Um, and it, well, I think it just might, might be helpful for our audience to hear a little bit more of some of the, the, the things that have affected you through your life. Sure, I would be happy to talk about that. And, you know, I want to also start by saying and, 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 and make an offering that I do believe that we all have resilience. I think that we all have the muscle of resilience. It's that some of us may be environments in which we have more opportunity to use it. We may have more information about how to access it. And that resilience is, is really activated environmentally and that environmental, environmental responses can help us access our resilience or can really tamp it down. And, and, and you are probably more familiar than even I am about the study where there's some animals in which they were, uh, and a traumatic event was induced for the animals. And those in whom an, a, a resilient, friendly environment was provided for them, they were more resilient faster than the animals for whom a non-resilient, friendly environment was provided. And also just being witnessed with compassion and empathy and being and having a presence around us allows us to be more resilient than those of us who are not witnessed because we are neurobiologically wired for community. So I just want to say I do believe we all have resilience inherently inside of us. And you know, I also think that we get, and, and you can speak more to the genetic part, of course, but we all, our stories set us up, right? And, and, and my family just got set up in some pretty significant social ways to have some hardship. And, and you know, my great grandmommy was a flop house alcoholic who murdered my great granddaddy and then burned down the family business and left town. So that's part of the story. As Marshall Gans at Harvard Kennedy School, that's part of one of the contamination threads in the story. But there are also these great redemption stories, like my three times great grandfather, Elijah Hensley, who was a Civil War hero who had a battlefield amputation at the Battle of Saltville in West Virginia, had a circular saw method amputation, and survived being thrown on the back of a horse drawn cart on what today is a five hour drive on a paved road, and was a prisoner of war and went on to be a successful farmer, one legged farmer in Eastern Kentucky. So I also have these stories of tremendous um, resilience. And, you know, I'm also a Brewster, which means my people committed tremendous genocide. You know, ten pilgrims who were religious refugees who sailed on the Mayflower. Um, and I have a, 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 a four times great grandmother who was full blooded Cherokee. So I, I believe that all of these things came and shaped me. And then, you know, my mom wanted to be famous and she, picked the daughter who sang, and I really got left behind in all of that. And so that's how I got set up to be the lost child. But there was a neighbor when I was in the 11th grade who was a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous who looked after me periodically. And she said to me, hey, I think there's a problem with alcoholism in your friend, in your family. And she showed me that there was another way to live. And that gave me a little bit of hope for that year. And, you know, um, then my grandmother took me in for my 12th grade. And, and I also had grandparents with whom I lived over the summers where I was fed and watered and went to a, a pool every day and had vacations. And so I, I had episodes of, um, of being cared for while I also had these episodes of tremendous neglect. And so um, that's a little bit of, of those stories, you know, and I also had a summer of commercial sexual exploitation when I lived in Japan as, as allegedly as a model when the first thing that happened on my first day in the office was I was told to take off all my clothes and walk around the office. So to say I had a mixed childhood is an understatement. And yet here I stand because of that gift of recovery that was given to me in 2006 and the choice to go to treatment. So, so maybe if I could just pick you up on that story about your ancestor who, uh, suffered a, a, I think you said an amputation of the leg. Is that correct? Yes. So yes. something almost similar happened to you only this year. I mean, there's some parallels here which are really hard to ignore. Isn't that correct? <laughs> yes. I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to imitate that part of the family story. So, no, you didn't mean to. Um, <laughs> yes. 
I don't know if it was Elijah Henley's right or left leg, but my nearly had my right leg amputated when I fell in the Congolese rainforest and um, almost had compartment syndrome and the leg broke in four places and my right foot was paralyzed and it took 67 hours to get help without any pain medication, I might also add. And, you know, what really helped me was that I was in community the entire time that I was suffering. When I first fell and I lay on the rainforest floor for five and a half hours with my leg shaped like a boomerang, a friend named Dieu Merci, whose name means thank you God, sat on his haunches without flinching, supporting the broken bones in my leg. And his eyes were just these deep wells of compassion. And so no one could do the suffering for me yet I didn't have to do my suffering alone. I was witnessed and known in my experience. And then my Congolese brothers carried me out of the rainforest. And then my sisters came to me and would say simply, je vous encourage, I encourage you. They didn't have a pain pill. They didn't have a splint. They didn't have an IV. You know, they didn't have a tourniquet, but they could say, I encourage you. And that touched my spirit. I, it's an extraordinary story. But it's, I think, particularly extraordinary because of what you've been through before. So I, I wonder whether your response to that event, how you cope with it, was affected by what you've been through in previous years. And do you think there are lessons there for how you managed to deal with it that you could pass on to others? I do, and I think that a spiritual practice is very important to my mental well-being and my emotional health because I have chosen to find a God of my own understanding, and that higher power is something very personal, it's very intimate, and I have tried on a lot of different kinds of higher powers over the years. You know, sometimes I call my higher power my creator, sometimes I simply call it love, Sometimes I call it nature. And, um, you know, some, was one time in Eastern Congo when I was with girls and women who were survivors of male sexual violence and gang rape from armed militias, I thought I needed a great big God who was bigger than Belgian colonialism, bigger than conflict mineral extraction and geopolitics. And I realized what I needed instead was a small personal God who loved me in my brokenness and my courageousness in facing atrocity. And so that helped me when I was in the Congo and I realized I needed a God who suffered with me, who was so, present and just suffered with me. So, so I think I, mean, I fully agree with you, those comments you made about how if you're gonna help other people, you probably need to help yourself first. And unless you have that inner strength, it's going to be very hard to pass that on. Um, and uh, this, I guess, is reflected in, in the work you've done uh, subsequently. So may maybe it'd be helpful to hear a little bit about that. You've mentioned visiting um, women in terrible circumstances and, and uh, um, what sort of lessons have you learned from them? And what might we generally learn about that, particularly around these issues about mental health? Yes, yeah, so being in community is very important. I always find that women group up together and in particular UNFPA, the UN Agency for Sexual and Reproductive Health and Rights for whom I serve as Google Ambassador, creates these safe spaces where women can tend with their children to their psychosocial well-being. And I find there's a lot of touch that goes on, which we know that skin on skin contact is very stimulating to our well-being. And um, you know, just a calm environment where we can re-regulate the parasympathetic nervous system. And when I, when I travel, I mean, we do, we do breathing, we do alternate nostril breathing. We, um, concentrate on the exhalation. We'll do tapping, you know, and we'll do something what, called what grace. Is, what? So Maybe. tapping. Um, yeah, what is that? I don't know. So tapping is a way to, um, to just settle and soothe the parasympathetic nervous system. So it's a pattern hmm. and it's found and it's known to be quite effective and it's, it's portable. It's, it's easily transmissible. And, um, there's something called the gray sequence that was developed by Dr. Dodge Ray, a clinical psychologist. And it, 
It incorporates a little bit of EMDR. It incorporates a little bit of pranayama from yoga, breath work, mm -hmm. and an ancient mudra. And it also, it, it's kind of an on the fly uh, desensitization for trauma. And these are all things that I use myself and they're very easy to teach to other people as well. That's an, an impressive set of skills that you've built up over, over the years. So you, you, you know from our previous conversation and you've told our audience that I'm a geneticist. And so I'm tending to look at these things from a, from a fairly hardcore biological basis. But on the other hand, one of the big advantages of using genetics is it actually gives us a bit of a handle on what is not genetics. In other words, the things that might be in the in environment. And one of the questions that we're often ask, asking ourselves is, is this one that we mentioned earlier about why is it that some people are, are more resilient uh, and, and than others? And, and from our perspective, certainly part of that has to be their, their, in their genetic constitution. It's a, to some extent a heritable trait, but it's been so far very hard to access that, to, to really make any in, in, inroads into understanding what the underlying biology of, of that might be. Um, one, I, one thing like from talking with you that obviously um, brings to the fore is whether we might do better start looking for some of the environmental causes of resilience. And I wondered from your own experience or the reading that you've done in this area, if you had any ideas as to why it is that some people might be more, more resilient than others? From environmental reasons? Yes. And, and also for people who are with us who may not necessarily know what environmental means in this context. Can you unpack that a little bit, please? Well, essentially it means everything, it's a, it's a catch-all term for everything that doesn't depend on your DNA. So everything that's, right. that's um, not inherited. Right. Um, you know, I think I saw it modeled in, in my mom. You know, she was so determined and so indefatigable. I mean, she really faced extraordinary odds. Um, sometimes there were things I knew that were probably age inappropriate for me to know, like when she was sexually harassed at work by a male boss who wanted her to go away for the weekend and he fired her when she didn't and we were paycheck to paycheck, but somehow or another she managed to keep going. You know, there were things like that that I knew when I was little and um, um, you know, whether it's houses in which we lived with substandard heating and her bringing in the coal and, you know, the things, the things that people who are housing insecure or who live in low income houses see all the time with parents who manage to make do. Mm. There were things like that that I saw growing up and also just her, her fierce determination to pursue her creative career. I mean, I saw that you just, you just don't give up. But I also think that in the recovery community is really where I have seen mm beautiful resilience, that, that there is a way to be happy and joyous and free, and that the, 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 the scores of the past can be settled, so to speak, right. and that it's mm -hmm. not that the, um, that the grief of the childhood can be resolved, and I may not be able to have a happy childhood, but I can make a good today and a beautiful future with a chosen family. I mean, that, that's such an optimistic message, Ashley. It's really good to hear that in, in a time when we get so much bad news that there are possibilities of uh, really progress and being able to cope with, with bad things happening to you. You've mentioned community quite a few times here, and um, that can mean an, a number of things. What do you think is important about community in, 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 the, in the healing process? Well, I can tell you the day that... Um you know, my beloved mother died by suicide. I had so many people to call. There were five women who were with me within moments of my sharing that tragic news with them. Mm. And they are my chosen sisters. And I was just reflecting overnight. I had one of my, you know, 2 a.m. wake ups overnight. And I was reflecting on those first days after her passing and how there was always someone with me at my house. You know, the first night my partner was still in, in Europe, thank God, because Pop was also in Europe. And my partner flew to Vienna to collect Pop and to fly him home because Pop never would have been able to navigate that transatlantic flight by himself. So that was a real blessing. 
but my friend slept with me in the bed and held my hand all night. You know, that's the value of community. And, and they organized the food and they took out the trash and they swept the porches and they put the furniture coverings on at night because it was still, you know, dewy. And my community held me physically and they held my home and they held my soul. And so there's that. And then, and then I, I, I came home to Tennessee on Sunday and I didn't want to come home to an empty house. So I was like, okay, who's home on Sunday at two o'clock? I'm coming to your house for a hang for a couple hours before I go home to Chanticleer. Um, because I know today that I exist as an individual, but I exist in fellowship. And I'm interdependent. I'm not meant to be anti-dependent or too independent. I'm meant to be interdependent. And that is totally different from the isolation of the childhood in which I grew up. So which I, sets us up for depression. Isolation sets us up for depression. I think that's a really, really important point. We, we as you know, run some large projects looking at the origins of, of depression. Uh, we focused on looking at it in, in women. And we've done that because... It's a commoner disease in, in women. And also because I'm a geneticist, there is a larger heritable component in, in women. And one of the things that we try and tease apart is the extent to which social um, effects are important. So we ask a series of questions around how our women have been in the past interacting with their partners, with their uh, anyone who's been close with them. And there is a clear relationship between isolation, those people who've not managed to establish good contacts, uh, as you say, are, are fairly isolated, and, and the risk of developing depression later. Now, I, I guess there's, there'll be people in this audience who, who will have, I hope not as bad as some of the experiences that you've been relating, but at least will have, you know, will 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 um, have at least some of the, the pain that, that, that you've been through. And I wonder what you think might be useful um, for those people to hear about uh, what you've been through? I think that 12-step programs are essential for a form of recovery. They are ubiquitous. They have membership for a different, a full spectrum of hurts mm -hmm. and challenges, you know, whether it's adult children of alcoholic and dysfunctional families whether it's survivors of incest anonymous, whether it's, you know, for compulsive shopping or gambling or debting spending, of course, there's Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, Anorexics and Bulimics Anonymous. 12-step programs are beautiful and they really work for people who, who, who apply those spiritual principles to their lives. And of course, the first word of every first step is we, you know, mm -hmm. it's about community. And I think a morning practice of some quiet time reading something that expresses my highest values and aspirations and ideals is a way to set me up to settle and soothe and to feel calm and centered and grounded I just spent some time with my wisdom teacher today and there's a lot going on in my life right now you know there we're approaching the five month anniversary of my mom's passing you know my sister's on tour I'm seeing two of the concerts this weekend which brings up a lot of deep poignancy, both joy and sorrow. Mm. Um, there's the legal piece of what's going on with my family. And my wisdom teacher remarked that I seemed very grounded and centered today. And that's because I have my morning practice in the meditation. I see. Um, so you mentioned a 12-step program. For those of us not familiar with that, could you briefly explain what you mean by that? Yes, I can. So the 12-step program, um, I'll actually just summarize what the 12 steps can do for a person who practices them. Um, they, are, they are a fellowship. They're not a secret society because of course we want people to know they exist. You can find them anywhere online, but individuals are asked to maintain their personal anonymity at the public level because no one speaks on behalf of a 12 step program. Um, um, but so if, 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 if one, for example, uh, wants to learn about uh, alcoholism, you might say, I'm powerless over alcohol and my life has become unmanageable. Mm. And then you can go on to uh, practice the 12 steps and it will expel the obsession to drink and enable the sufferer to live usefully and happily whole. And that principle can be applied to any problem. There's even racists anonymous. 
I see. Okay, that's that's. I think that's helpful. And you think this is also something that would be applied for the, the traumatic experiences people have been through. The sorts of experiences you would you mentioned in your in your work for the, for the United Nations is is this appropriate for those for those sorts of problems too? So I think that um, that it that it can support trauma healing. Yes, but mm. the, but but for, but trauma is a very specific animal, right? because trauma is an undigested memory that is iterative, intrusive, and vivid, and hijacks the body and needs evidence-based care, something like EMDR. Yeah, yeah. No, I think I, we'd, we'd agree with that. So we, we've discussed um, some rather grim subjects here. I wonder whether just stepping back and looking at this from a broader perspective, we focused on the, and I think we'd all agree, the importance of, of community, of interaction, of setting up better relationships, close relationships with uh, individuals. How do you think overall in society, in the society in, in the US that we do with establishing community? And if, we're, if you think we're not doing it well, are there any lessons for us to improve that? I think that's a really good question for reflection. And I think our Surgeon General, Dr. Vivek Murthy speaks very uh, eloquently and passionately about the loneliness epidemic in America. And some of us are good at establishing community people. Uh, there's a lot of research that shows that folks who volunteer are happier, they live longer. Um, you know, I, I don't know how you feel about the saying, what, what, fires, to, uh, what fires together, wires together. Mm. Um, but when we, when we connect with our fellows, we do, you know, different regions of the brain light up like the anterior singlet. And, um, it's good for us, but we don't have as much these days as we used to because of those little devices on which we're talking right now. And so I encourage, you know, community and myself, I watch for that tendency to isolate in myself and hopefully I'm fostering it in my wider community by making those connections myself and by reaching out to people. Mm -hmm. you know? Yes. So, so put it briefly, you're blaming this for some of our problems, Will that be correct. Hey, you know, it's the race to the bottom of the brain stem. Yes. <laughs> I wonder, though, if there's anything that we might be able to suggest to, this is, I'm not sure you and I are going to solve this problem here, but at least we can throw this out there. Like, like, is there anything that we might suggest to improve things? Is there any sort of simple, I mean, going back to your 12 step issue, maybe there should be a 12 step for weeding us off our social media devices and allowing us more time to interact with um, others. Well, there's also been some research lately about the about the benefits of talking to strangers, you know, um, and and just interacting with with, uh, with folks we we don't necessarily know. And well, I have to say, as we, um, we Brits don't do that sort of thing, as you know, Ashley. <laughs> well brought up. My mother taught me never talk to strangers, so I'm going to find that a very hard one to break. But... <laughs> what would I recommend? Um, You know, th there are some really good old fashioned ways to connect with community, a book club, a hobby club, a knitting circle, uh, a quilting bee, joining a, a community sport club. Like I, I remember when I was really active in my church and I played softball in the church in the church league. I mean, all of those things may seem so quaint, but they're really good for our mental health. I think that's uh, that touches on this something you also mentioned about um, if, if things uh, parts of the brain are active that sets up some pattern of the uh, firing and wiring connection, and um, and yes, I mean that's something we as neuroscientists are, are deeply interested in and in trying to work out. And this, it, it's clear, for example, that if you take a set of animals uh, who are genetically identical and allow them um, access to um, some social space and there's some food source and so on. Gradually over time, what happens is those animals become different, even though the genetic basis for each of them is exactly the same. And so that their personalities represented by whatever internal structures, the wiring is, is, is happening. So we know that sort of process does occur. 
And uh, I suppose the positive message that we can give to our listeners today is that if you didn't undertake these sorts of activities, that exposure itself, as you were saying, could increase your ability to take enjoyment for life. And, and of course, conversely, it, it, it means that if you are finding yourself isolated, that can be a vicious circle. And it's something that we, we'd like to try and try and break somehow, which, of course, raises the question we were discussing a moment ago as to how to do that. And, and that's, that, that, is, that is going to be really hard. Yes. Yes, but you're worth it. You're worth <laughs> it. So. Let's hope so. Um, do you think that anything that you've learned from, from being in the media, um, are there lessons about that that other people might have? I mean, it's, you've, you've had a, uh, an opportunity that is not possible for most people, and you have public exposure, that people will know you, there's, there's recognition. Um, is that something you think it, that is helpful to you? So I'm, I may surprise you and go a slightly different direction. You know, what I've learned in by being about, you know, from being in the media is that healthy boundaries are essential for good mental health. <laughs> that I really have to, that, that self-esteem comes from within, mm. that my identity is something that has to be self-generated and self-validated. And as my many taught me, um, 33% of the people are gonna love me no matter what I do. 33% of the people really don't care. And 33% of the people aren't going to like me no matter what I do. And that globally, it's none of my business what other people think of me. You know, it's between the God of my understanding and me. And, uh, you know, my, my, my core values are really set with my most intimate friends, my closest advisors, you know, like a spiritual director or a, a sponsor mentor type of person who knows me and knows my heart and knows my soul and that the rest of it is just static. And so that's really what I've learned by being in the media, you know, and I can't take care of myself and another person's feelings at the same time. I mean, can you give us a specific example of this? So in the work that you've done in, in film, for example, is, is, are there been cases where you've found it just overwhelming with the attention that you've been getting? Well, I can, I mean, I can give a really vulnerable example right now, for example, because, um, you know, I've always enjoyed being, being very fit. I'm a, I'm an athlete. I'm a half marathon runner. I am a backpacker. I climbed a lot in the Great Smoky Mountain National Park and the Alps. And since I broke my leg in four places and paralyzed my foot, and then I actually had another fracture over the summer, which I haven't told anybody about until now I had a condyle fracture in my femur which was unrelated and just this freak accident, you know, and then since my mom and everything, I've put on some weight and I'm sure people are talking about it, but I don't pay any attention to it because I know it's a temporary condition and the weight will come off when it is supposed to, because it's none of my business, what people think of me, you know, it's, it's a, it's an experience I'm having as a 54 year old woman. And I put some pictures on Instagram at my sister's concert. And I'm sure that there is a, there is a cohort of people who are being vilely ugly about it. And it is absolutely none of my business. I have a healthy boundary about it. But I also know that misogyny is a real uh, thing in our culture. And you try being a, 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 you know, a once ultra fit woman who's 54 and put on some weight, that is uh, going to spark some very sexist conversation by both men and women and others in our culture. Well, given what you've told us and the, your ability to cope with um, uh, what for most people will be sort of crushing disasters, I'm pretty certain that you will you'll manage to get over this as well. But I'm, I'm your story about another fracture and uh, happening, it, it reminds me of the work that was done some years ago, examining the um, records of an insurance company to look at um, drivers who wrecked their cars. Uh, and a pattern emerged that there were some drivers who were just reporting many, many more accidents than others. And this, the idea that, that, that uh, accidents were happening randomly turned out not to be true. Uh, which, of course, you can imagine, because we all know people who drive recklessly because of their uh, their personality, which reflects their genetic makeup. But in your case, the sort of disasters that are falling you do indeed seem to be completely out of the blue. And I, it's an extraordinary yeah. world, but it's of things I'm 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 sorry for you. I I wish I had a way of preventing these sorts of things, but I think you need need to be have a divine abilities to stop that. I'm so sorry, Ashley. 
Thank you. Thank anyway. you. It healed very healed in two months lickety split. It was it was what it was. And it, you know, clumsiness is associated with grief, you know. And there were mm. other people in our family after mom died who fell downstairs and had accidents. And you know, that's just what mine happened to look like. And um, it really allowed me to to grieve. It really allowed me to stop what I was working on at the moment and to grieve. Well, um, we've we've had some stories of extraordinarily bad things and also of, of great recuperation. And we've discussed how we might use these to help our fellow citizens and, and generally in, improve people's mental health. Um, and I think we're fairly soon we're going to open it up to questions. But before we do so, is there anything particularly you wanted to ask me? You know, I think it would be really neat to have an update about just where you are precisely with your work, looking at the genetic uh, component of depression, if that's even an accurate summary of what you're doing right now. I'll give you a very brief discussion because I don't want to interrupt too long with our chance to, um, to have questions. But very briefly, we know the following. We know that the susceptibility to depression is in part, and I stress in part, genetic. And to put that technically, about 40% uh, of the variability in risk is attributable to genetic variation. And we're in the process of identifying regions in the genome, not genes, but just regions in the genome, which increase that risk. And once we have those fully identified, we're in a strong position to understand the biology, the pathways that lead to that, uh, to allow us to develop, therefore, an understanding of the mechanisms, have better treatments and improve people's lives. But to go back to what we were reflecting on earlier, all of these discoveries are also a handle on how to understand what's happening uh, from the environmental side. So if you have a very complex problem, you don't know where to start. If you can at least take this part of it, it's the genetic side, put it out. That means the rest, which we were discussing earlier, the environmentals. So it gives you a little handle on that so we can begin to pull it apart. And the examples we take for, like in, in your case will be here is someone who's, who's survived, who's clearly very resilient. I want to sequence your genome. Maybe Ashley, you'll be able to give us some clues as to what's going on. Oh, that would be really exciting. Okay. That would be really exciting. Thank you for that update and thank you for what you're doing. It's very special and important. And thank you so much for sharing your stories this evening. And Pleasure. I would like to add our thanks to both Ashley and Jonathan. Um, Ashley, thank you for being so open, so vulnerable and courageous and for sharing your pain and the resiliency skills you've developed to cope with hardship and trauma. I think you've taught us so much tonight about community and the importance of it. And you've given us a lot to think about, so thank you. And Jonathan, um, you are a brilliant interviewer, not only just a brilliant geneticist and neuroscientist, but this might be something you could add to your career. Um, you ask very pertinent questions and, um, and, and shared your vast knowledge and expertise with us. So thank you to both of you. Um, and uh, I'm glad that UCLA brought you from across the pond. We are very lucky to have you. So on to our questions. Um, we have a question from Sherry and Garen Staglin, um, who are joining us from Napa. And um, I'm just going to add that their son, Brandon, was a speaker for us um, just a few months ago for an open mind. And um, so they uh, are asking, um, first they comment that uh, Ashley, you traveled with them and your godmother Piper Evans in France during a YPO trip to Paris. They are asking how has your audience or your fan base allowed you to empower others to speak up about their own mental health conditions and avoid the stigma that surrounds these illnesses? Well, I think that's a great question for uh, both the good doctor and me because depression is the number one public health morbidity. And it is important to talk about it because it is in some ways very normative. And if we're not talking about something that so many people are experiencing, we're really hobbling ourselves from addressing it. And so there, to me, there is this paradox or even um, sort of strange, uh, I, I don't mean to use hypocrisy in a negative way, but it's just it just is so um, puzzling to me if we're not talking about depression openly and honestly, 
when so many people are experiencing it in a, in a very routine way. And, you know, I think that, I think that, um, you know, whether it's the fan mail I receive where people are sharing their spirit, their experiences of, of childhood sexual abuse, of, 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 of male sexual violence or their experiences with depression. And that certainly validates that it's, it's appropriate for me to speak up and to share my own stories, particularly of recovery, because it's abusive to point out problems without also highlighting and guiding people to, to, to solutions and to, and to emphasize it is 100% possible to heal and the healing arts are abundant and beautiful and accessible. I'd just like to, to reiterate those points. I think um, one of the, some of the work that we do has been in, in uh, communities, particularly in East Asia, where it's, it's very hard to talk openly about uh, any psychiatric illness uh, and that we come across cases where um, the, they are only admitted to hospital when things have got so extreme that, that uh, it's been you know, really hard to treat such people. And, and it's, it's obvious that improving our ability to communicate these things and talk about it is, is, is really vital to that. Uh, and we've begun discussing this with, um, with the media. Can we have more open discussion, just providing, just initially at least, just informational stuff, like um, um, small videos to give us good examples of what's possible. Thank you both. Um, we have a question here from um, an anonymous attendee. Um, goes on to say, for people who have been victimized, it is not uncommon for them when they seek justice to be re-victimized by the justice system. Yet the act of seeking justice can also be important in healing. Ashley, can you speak to the upside and downside of your attempt to seek justice for sexual assault? And yes. can we hear if there is actual neuroscience around the need benefit to seeking justice and being heard that helps with resilience or healing? So that's mm. both of you here. Yes. Yes. Would you like to go first? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> it's a difficult question. Um, Very difficult question. Yeah. I. I... Ashley, what do you think saved me here? I'm struggling with this one. Yes, to... no, it's it's um, absolutely dealing with the system. It can be the second rape, and uh, it's you know we need we need trauma informed responses. We need uh, female centered care, and I 100% hear the need for justice as well, and. That's one of the reasons why I not only have been to treatment, but I will continue to do workshops because I need to resolve my trauma internally in empowered and safe places that are feminist, so to speak, because those places are safe for me where I can work out the pain, the anger, the rage, I can fight back. I can have the catharsis, the, the undigested, intrusive, iterative, painful memory can be stored properly and integrated. So it becomes this organic grief that I work through. And then I can show up as an empowered survivor and seek my justice rather than being traumatized while going through a traumatizing system that is still very dysfunctional. That's a very powerful answer. Very, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Leo. Thank you for sharing your story, Ashley. I love what you've said about community. From my experience, building community requires opening up and being somewhat vulnerable. Did you find that to be the case and was it a challenge for you to be vulnerable? How would you recommend getting past that hurdle? Thank you so much. Yeah. Leo, that is such a good question. And yes, I can I can tell you a story. I mean, it requires letting people getting to know me and me getting to know people, you know, and building that sense of safety and trust and belonging. And um, I, I had a, a healing weekend at my house once with a group of women and we had we had it, um, the food brought in. 
And we were all agreeing that we'd had such a special time that we wanted to repeat the event the following year. And one of the women said, and maybe we can do the grocery shopping and the cooking together. And I froze because I was enjoying it, but I didn't know if I could handle the intimacy of standing next to another woman at the stove and frying eggs together. Like that was a little too close for me. That was a little too much. And now I'm telling you what, I can sling hash with anybody. <laughs> <laughs> I can do the shopping, I can plan the menu, I can go to the Smoky Mountains with a picnic basket. You know, it takes time, it does take trust and little by slow, little by slow, you know, you try one little conversation and if it goes well, and you feel safe, you can try a little bit more. And also, um, you know, repairs in, 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 you know, some relationships are worth saying, hey, when I tried that, it didn't feel particularly good. Can we talk about that? You know, so you can test relationships to see if they have the strength and the resiliency to make a repair. And that will tell that will help feed back to you the quality of that relationship and whether it's worth continuing to invest in it, your emotional investment, or if that's one that's meant to be just a more casual, distant friendship. Mm. Thank you, Leo. Such a good question. And thank you for the great answer there, Ashley. Excellent. Thank you, Ashley. Um, there is a question from Julie for Dr. Flint, for Jonathan, for Dr. Flint. How does identifying your psychiatric phenotype impact which medications will be the most effective for depression? So we're back to the depression grand challenge. Indeed. So that's a great question. Thanks for raising it. And I, and I guess what's behind this is this idea that in the future, we may be able to go to doctors who will give us a medication um, personalized uh, based on a series of tests that they might they might need to carry out. And there are a, this is a, a great hope, and many of us are, are expecting this to to change the way that medicine is practiced, not just in psychiatry but across all conditions. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one of the components of this is genetics um, that we would want to have on an understanding of somebody's DNA sequence because everyone's different and that's encoded to a large extent, not completely uh, in their genome. And there are already cases where we can use that information to say, for example, you're not going to metabolize this particular drug well, so I'm going to give you this one instead. Uh, and I, that's, we're getting there in psychiatry less so than in, than in other conditions. Psychiatry always tends to lag behind the lots of complicated reasons we haven't got time to go into here, but, um, um, I'll take a risk and give you a prediction that maybe in, let's say, 10 years, when you go to your psychiatrist, you'll get a much more personalized prescription than you're getting at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Flint. Um, we have a question from Dr. Linda Erkeley, who um, has also spoken at our Open Mind. Um, and is, uh, she works with largely older adults at UCLA. Many of them are traumatized and need to address this with self-care and exercises to bolster their resilience. Many, however, do not have access to resources, largely to being shut-ins or having financial challenges. Do you have any advice for how to bolster resilience for people who have reduced access to resources? Mm -hmm. Ashley, mm -hmm. any ideas here? Yes. So. Um... I do think there are practitioners who offer EMDR online at a sliding scale and the emdr.org website can help find practitioners in one's area. And I think that's worth exploring and because there's an EMDR, you know, first of all, EMDR is eye movement desensitization. I can't remember what the R stands for, but it is an evidence-based modality that can be done on an online platform. So I would definitely recommend exploring EMDR for desensitizing trauma. And then um, how do we get how do we get seniors who are isolated connected um, mm -hmm. in community? Like are there other ways of um... This is my ignorance about the way the social um, support operates here. I mean, do you have um, social workers who can help make the connections to other sort of community groups that people can get involved in? I don't know. This is an area I know little about. I don't practice medicine. Yeah, I mean, 
yeah, but it's a it's a very specific question, and you know I want to like find out more about the community and dial it in, but I definitely think that the EMDR platform online is something to explore, yeah. and um, that would be my contribution for now. Thank you, Dr. Berkeley, for the question. Well, I'm afraid we are out of time, and I know we could go on and on because this has been such a fascinating conversation. Um, I'm going to end with Natasha's comment. Thank you both for this invaluable hour. Ashley, please count me as part of the 33% that like you no matter <laughs> what. <laughs> well, I'm sure she's pushed it to more than 33%. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely you have. You were uh, just brilliant, warm, kind, loving, and have taught us so much. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Flynn. Thank you to everybody that's joined us this evening. Um, thank you for the privilege of your time. We are honored to have you here and hope that you'll attend more Open Mind programs. Um, our next one is actually on Monday, November 7th, when we will have the uh, acting head of the, um, she is the uh, acting head of the, uh, she's, sorry, she's the acting surgeon general for California. And she will be speaking about bipolar disorder, which she uh, very bravely wrote about in the LA Times. Um, so I hope you'll join us for that and many other programs. And uh, from all of us at the Friends of Semmel and the Resnick Board, thank you. And good night. Stay safe, stay well. Good night. Good night. Thank you so much. Really a treat. A treat for all of us.